everybody. Welcome. I'm David Levy. I'm dean of the Duke Law School. We are living in the midst of a global economic convulsion due in part, in large part, to the collapse of the U.S. banking system and the insolvency of many of our largest financial institution, institutions. And one might think that this is a profound event, and I don't think we know yet, but it may be. It certainly caused a great deal of damage, and it also has the potential to change our thinking. Uh, we wonder why did this happen, and in hindsight, some of these reasons seem fairly clear. And yet, I don't think that anyone wanted this to happen, and therefore, one may wonder these, why we did not see these things that seem now so clear. Why, for example, did our colleagues in the Department of Economics not see these things? Why did the business school not see these things? Perhaps some of our professors will say that they did see these things, but it's even fair for those of us in the law school to ask, where were we and why did we not see what was coming? Is there something about our view of the regulatory state that now must change? Perhaps our image is wrong. Perhaps it is frozen in the 19th century. We, we think still in terms of regulation versus laissez-faire. And we have in mind the traffic cop on the, on the beat, checking the doors and writing tickets. But perhaps the model really is much more of a transportation model. The government builds the roads, and it's on the roads that we travel. Uh, we don't have to travel the, on those roads, but once the highway is built, that's the way we tend to go. And if we go too fast, the government may give us a ticket as well. But there's much more to regulation than, than tickets. There's also inducements and incentives. And in this area of banking, which we're going to be looking at today, the government, after all, controls the money supply. And much of that is, in any broad view, regulation. So there's much to think about. Uh, this is the first of our, our panels in a program that we think will be quite wonderful here at the law school and across the university, looking, and re looking at and reconsidering the modern regulatory state. Uh, all parts of the university will have something to contribute to this discussion. We're starting with financial services here today because of the current situation that we find ourselves in, but then we will move beyond to look at all government regulation, all aspects of restraint and incentive that will guide conduct and institutions in all fields of endeavor in the coming years. And who better to lead this program and this exciting development in the law school uh, than Lawrence G. Baxter, a professor of the practice of law. He has rejoined the law school this year. He held tenure at the University of Natal in South Africa from 1978 to 1984. He then joined the Duke Law School as a tenured faculty member in 1986. In 1995, he left the law school to join Wachovia Bank as special counsel for strategic development. He is one of the leading scholars in the field of administrative law. Uh, he's also an expert in domestic and global banking and regulation. He received his Bachelor of Law and Bachelor of Commerce in Business from the University of Natal, his Diploma in Legal Studies and LLM from the University of Cambridge, and his PhD in Law and Government Regulation from the University of Natal. Professor Baxter will introduce our distinguished panel. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Dean Levy, and thank you to Duke University for supporting this initiative. Uh, we've really been lucky about the timing, uh, though not so lucky, of course, as citizens. Um, I think everybody would agree that uh, capitalism is experiencing quite a challenge right now. In fact, some are suggesting that it is the crisis of capitalism. For over a century, free markets have been the favored an entrenched method of advancing national and individual wealth in countries that we considered successful. Of course, the United States, 
uh, and regulation has been the exception, often regarded as a necessary evil, and certainly government economic activity regarded as a last resort. Um, all of a sudden, taxpayers are finding themselves in a position of possibly being some kind of shareholder in some of our nation's largest companies. Uh, and that's not unique to the United States. The Royal Bank of Scotland, for example, is 85% owned by the British government now. And uh, this has led to the wild circulation on the internet uh, of a quote from Karl Marx, which I'll read to you. Owners of capital will stimulate the working class to buy more and more expensive goods, houses, and technology, pushing them to take more and more expensive credits until the debts become unbearable. The unpaid debt will lead to the bankruptcy of banks, which will have to be nationalized, and the state will have to take the road, which will eventually lead to communism. You'll all be very relieved to know I checked this out and found out that it was a hoax. But it does sound deliciously Marxian, and uh, it certainly sounds like the writings of neo-Marxists of the 1970s. Of course, a lot of political heat has been generated in the process as well. Uh, demands by uh, politicians representing uh, views of the public in general uh, for intervention in the management of large companies and tighter control all completely understandable and in many cases justifiable. Uh, just last week, uh, Congressman Barney Frank, chair of the Financial Services Committee of the House of Representatives, asserted a classic activist shareholder position when in relation to the AIG bonuses, uh, he said that, and I quote, we should look at AIG as owner of the company. The time has come to exercise our rights as owner rather than interfering with contracts between two parties. You didn't perform, you don't get bonuses. This is a language we haven't heard for a very long time. Uh, of course, this was met by equal fury uh, from uh, the industries themselves. Um, the Wall Street Journal today has an article entitled On Wall Street Talk of Trust and Civil War. Uh, John Authors of the Financial Times has quipped, no doubt, with apologies to Dylan Thomas, I quote, emotion is high on all sides. Wall Street is raging against the dying of the light, and Congress is responding to populist rage. Well, there are more balanced efforts afoot. Uh, one of the people bearing the brunt of this is the Treasury Secretary, uh, Tim Geithner, uh, who has been patiently tracing out a plan for a public-private partnership uh, in order to uh, provide the capital necessary to deal with the assets uh, that have gone so bad so quickly. Uh, unexpectedly, we've all become familiar, I dare, say, dare not say it's a household set of terms, but we are familiar with terms like TARP and TELF and CAP and KIP and so on and so forth. Uh, it's hard to know what any of those mean at times, but they are nevertheless arcane principles of government financing of industry that have been deployed uh, in billions and billions of dollars over the past few uh, months. The one word that has started to circulate in vocabulary is the dreaded N-word, nationalization. For a while, there were academic commentators who talked about the need to nationalize the banks, and their views were disregarded even after the British government bought 85% of the capital of the Royal Bank of Scotland, which seems to me to come pretty close to nationalizing the Royal Bank of, of Scotland. But the currency of the term did not uh, elevate to public usage until uh, leading Republicans and the former chairman of the Fed, Alan Greenspan, actually came out and said, we will have to nationalize the banks, and all of a sudden, it became a major term of concern and interest. But what does it mean? Does it mean that we adopt a shareholder role in companies and exercise the classic rights of shareholders? Or is it a sleeping partnership that we provide the capital uh, subject to certain conditions but then stay out? Uh, is it uh, a temporary conservatorship, a little bit like the FDIC seizing a financial institution in trouble? Uh, or does it inevitably lead to full-scale government inter intervention and management of the companies themselves?
The consequences are not clear. Um, they are drastic, depending on the extremes that this goes to, and they're going to take years to trace. This public-private partnership is a delicate one that this uh, panel uh, is going to start exploring, but of course it will take a long time to work through. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel, and uh, I'm going to introduce each of the speakers uh, in, uh, at this point so the conversation can flow freely across the panel, uh, and then I will try to manage the time so we ha have time for questions from the audience. Um, I should also uh, warn one of our distinguished members of the audience that if we get into deep trouble about the technicalities of, of uh, the troubled asset uh, liquidity program, we have an expert on the subject sitting in the audience from the University of North Carolina Law School, Lisa Broom. Uh, I didn't warn her about that before she came up here, but uh, uh, this is an I illustration of the uh, level of interest uh, in the subject. The first speaker is Bob Steele. Um, Bob, is a, on my left, is a history and political science graduate of Duke and an MBA graduate of Chicago. He was a senior fellow at the Kennedy School. He is the current chair of the Board of Trustees of Duke University and a director of Wells Fargo, and he has been a vice chairman of Goldman Sachs. Uh, he was CEO of Wachovia last year uh, as he steered that troubled institution uh, through to its acquisition by Wells Fargo. Uh, and directly before that, he was Under Secretary of the Treasury for Domestic Financial Affairs. So no one is better qualified to speak on this issue of public policy than Bob. Uh, Ed Green, to Bob's left, uh, is a partner at Cleary Gottlieb in New York. He's a graduate of Amherst and Harvard and was General Counsel of the Securities and Exchange Commission in the 1980s and then more recently General Counsel of Citigroup's Institutional Clients Group, City, Citicorp's Institutional Clients Group. He's the author of numerous books and articles and has been recognized by Chambers as one of the best global capital markets lawyers in the world. Uh, Ed has been at the heart of the action up in New York and he's witnessed the turbulence firsthand. So we look forward to learning his views from the street, as it were. Uh, professor Craig Bernstein, Burnside is a professor of economics at Duke. He is to Ed's left. Um, he also has taught at the University of Virginia, Pittsburgh, and Queens University. And he was the lead economist for the World Bank from 1995 to 2002. Uh, he's published extensively and consulted for the Fed, the IMF, and the banks of Canada and Portugal. And uh, his special interests are in business cycles, currency markets, government finance, and the effects of foreign aid. Uh, he has witnessed firsthand currency crises around the world, and we're looking forward to his macroeconomic perspective and a kind of international reality check. Uh, Professor Jim Cox, to Craig's left, is well known to this audience as the Brainerd Curry Professor of Law. Extensively published prominent authority on domestic and international securities regulation, for which he was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Southern Denmark, and on financial information accounting. His voice is familiar to NPR listeners and to Congress, where he's testified many times. And uh, Jim will speak, uh, speak uh, to us about corporate governance principles, shareholder responsibility and liability, and executive compensation issues. Uh, Steve Schwartz, to Jim's left, is, is the Stanley A. Starr Professor of Law and Business, an adjunct professor of business administration, and a co-director of the Interdisciplinary Global Capital Markets Center here at Duke. Steve is an expert on structured finance, all those assets, but well before they went bad, right? Uh, and a partner at Sherman Sterling and Kay Scholler, extensively published with a special interest and a, a leading authority on systemic risk, and as an engineering graduate on the complexity principles that have contributed uh, toward the dilemma that we find ourselves in now. Uh, Bill Brown, to Steve's left, is uh, a Duke Law graduate and a walking interdisciplinarian himself. Uh, he's a visiting professor of law at Duke, uh, but he's also an entrepreneur venture capitalist who's founded not one but two companies, financing and commercializing biomedical devices, energy, telecom, and automotive ventures. But he's also been in the engine room of this financial crisis at an earlier stage where he held leadership positions at Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and AIG in both New York and London. I uh, practiced law at Donovan Leisure and at Sydney and Austin. 
And one of his most interesting activities right now is something called the Duke Project, which is a collaboration by students in the law school, and I think there are some uh, cross-disciplinary uh, students as well, uh, who have been exploring and examining every dimension of this crisis, each producing papers, bringing speakers in, and appearing on television. So uh, this has been something in which we've gotten the students heavily engaged in as well, and they're all acutely aware that they're dealing with something that will be their future uh, in a more profound way than we have uh, experienced in at least a generation. Bill is going to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the shadow financial system. Uh, the banking system used to be the dominant industry in financial services. It is now, as Bill will point out, only a portion of the financial services industry. And just the day before yesterday, Secretary Geithner and Chairman Bernanke testified in Congress that there is a need for a systemic risk regulator for that part of the industry as well, raising all the questions we will be looking at today. So without further ado, uh, let me thank you all for coming and turn this over to our distinguished panel, uh, starting with Bob Steele, who is going to set the stage for us. Thank you, Bob. Great. Thank you very much, Lawrence, uh, for uh, that kind introduction. And let me just say it's a privilege for me to be here uh, on such a distinguished panel. And congratulations to the law school for convening uh, such a timely topic. Uh, I just don't think you could have imagined that uh, yesterday the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve Board and today the prime minister of Great Britain are all talking about these same issues and to kind of shine a light and try to bring knowledge to them at this particular time is just uh, quite prescient, so I, I thank you for that. Uh, my assignment really was to provide some introductory remarks before the panel developed, uh, and so uh, let me see if I can do that. Uh, and I thought I would focus on really three aspects. Uh, number one is just what is the condition of the banking industry and what are the events over the last 12 months that have transpired to put us in this place? And then maybe secondly talk about uh, just what are some of the choices that we face today with regard to banks and non-bank financial institutions. And lastly, uh, I might take the liberty of describing some uh, areas of regulatory reform that, that I believe might be important going forward. So with those three goals, and hopefully just in a few minutes, uh, lead us in to a more full discussion with all the other panel members. If we start with the historical perspective, uh, we all know that banking and financial services have changed dramatically uh, over the recent years. Um, the, the goal and the central function of banks has now been adjusted, as Lawrence suggested, where lots of non-bank financial institutions outside the well-developed regulatory and supervisory framework of banks uh, are now doing lots of the same things of banks. And you pick your favorite trend, whether it's globalization, whether it's consolidation, uh, um, or just the pr proliferation of services that, that basically have characterized all of this. Um, we all know what banks do. The, the simple description I remember from my money in banking class is basically uh, the maturity extension, where we basically put deposits in a bank and the bank allows us to extend maturities and finance longer term activities that require finance that balances that. And, and basically lending those and providing capital to people that want to do things, whether it's a home, a car, expand a business and things like that. And historically in this country, there's a very well-developed pedagogy by which banks are reviewed, supervised, uh, and examined. And, and then there is prompt and corrective action when banks seem to get off the road. And so that's developed, and it's been pretty successful uh, in this country. But now we have this blurring of activities with non-bank financial institutions doing what banks used to do, and banks doing what non-bank financial institutions used to do. And this has developed quite uh, purposefully, uh, whether it was um, overturning the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933 with Graham Leach Bliley in 1999, or whether it's other chips that have been made in terms of allowing universal banks to expand the, the, the ambit of what they do. Uh, today, that's basically where we are, and it has had lots of benefits of providing finance in lots of places. But it seems as though now this, is kind of, this system has to be questioned, and we need to say and stop and say just what's been happening. And here's where I ask you to just take a bit of liberty with me. It's almost impossible to imagine, and for people who've spent their life studying these areas, it's almost impossible to imagine 
that this all has happened in one year. It was just 12 months ago this month uh, that Bear Stearns uh, was basically bought by J.P. Morgan and the series of financial institutions that have been unsuccessful, <coughs> uh, nearly <coughs> failed, or acquired by competitors in very dis distressed situations is almost unimaginable. And the consequence of this is quite important, and that is investor confidence in financial institutions has eroded, and it's caused market conditions and consumer confidence to abruptly deteriorate. To my mind, most often, it's economic conditions that lead to stress in financial institutions, and I think in this case, it's actually in some ways been backwards uh, where the distress in financial institutions led to challenges in the real economy. Uh, and that's an odd difference that I think you need to think about, and it just stresses the fact uh, of how important it is that people have confidence in financial institutions, and when there's a crack in that dike, that it's quite uh, unattractive for what it can mean to the real economy. And, and you know, this volatility uh, doesn't fall equally on everyone. Uh, volatility is most painful to those people who are most vulnerable. And, and that's the reason why I think there's so much of a social issue that we're being hearing about here. And people that don't realize that I think are not getting an important part of this. And, and that that's something we all have to recognize. Um, today, we basically, as I said, have had a year where the markets have declined by more than 35%. Uh, unemployment has increased by 300 basis points from 5.1% to 8.1%. GDP has dropped dramatically. And, and if you take the largest institutions, just for this, I took the four largest um, uh, brokerage firms, the four largest banks, and the four largest insurance companies, and, and the impairment has been over $600 billion of market capitalization by those 12 companies, $600 billion. And we all know the names of the firms who have disappeared, and whether it's Lehman Brothers, AIG, the GSEs, uh, we've seen Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs become bank holding companies, and the government now owns 35% of Citibank, and has invested, whether it's 45 billion in Bank America, 25 billion in JP Morgan, and 25 in Wells Fargo, and 10 in Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Just imagine all of this has happened in the last year. It sounds impossible to imagine so much could have changed in just 12 months. So where are we today as a result of, of these changes and what are the questions that we should all be thinking about? For me, the key questions are what does it mean to be a shareholder, a shareholder in an institution that's now partially owned by the government? Um, when we read the papers, most of the time it's talking about what does it mean for the government to be a shareholder? Um, and, and I guess we're all taxpayers, but I think we also have to think about the consequences for the current shareholders because we have to have a system that shareholders believe can work for them. And so while we're doing what we think we have to be done, it's the longer term consequences of this uh, partial nationalization that we have to think about. Second, what's the ambition for these partially nationalized companies? And I think there are a couple of choices here. Uh, is this a temporary respite uh, and the plan will be for them to be privatized and become fully owned and, and distinct public companies with no government involvement? That's one. Uh, two, should they be wound down and liquidated? Uh, um, and that's a strategy we currently. Or should the government be actively involved? Should they be formally nationalized? And, and that's the example that we're currently living with with the GSEs. Well, I know my preference is either one or two over three. I'd prefer that the companies be returned to the public markets. I'd prefer that they be wound down in an orderly fashion. Or, and I think those are both preferable to the third choice. The third choice has some applicability, but for me, I, I think that's the right way. The sole act of government ownership uh, in an unhealthy institution doesn't make it strong. Uh, the assets are still the same. The, the balance sheet that stress still exists, and nationalizing them simply transfers all of that uncertainty and those questionable assets from the previous public owners now to the government. And that seems to me to be inappropriate in lots of ways, and that a government-managed process would be better to think about either returning to the public markets or for um, winding down. So then you turn to the issue, the last thing which I said I would speak about for just a moment, and that is the whole idea of what are the regulatory reforms that we should be thinking about. I believe that, that we should think about, let's start with the idea that we have a financial regulatory system that's been built over almost 70 years, uh, brick by brick by brick, on top of each other, 
often in response to a specific crisis, but never with an overarching ambition of what would we make it look like if we started afresh. And so I think now the time is to, to borrow the phrase that's commonly being used, you don't want to waste a good crisis, and here the goal should be to basically back up and think about what's the right regulatory structure that we think we should have. And I think you're starting to see this develop by the, um, the policy makers in Washington, and I think that's a good thing. Let me just talk about some of the first things that I believe we should think of. One is that uh, a year ago the Treasury Department published something called the Blueprint for a Modernized Regulatory Structure, uh, which highlighted really three aspects to it. The first was that there should be some type uh, of what we called uh, um, the idea of a a systematic risk or a market stability regulator, and that this should be someone that has the ability to look across all the system and look everywhere and have the equivalent of a double O license to go anywhere, ask anything, and do anything. And it's not because I believe they'll always be successful in finding out the next thing, but just the effort of doing that has to have some good of salutary effect. And it also will have them be more knowledgeable when something does happen, they'll be they'll have been in the institutions and they'll be able to understand and react. I believe, more promptly. If we think about that, uh, the second thing I think that's been a, a, a challenge here is that we have multiple jurisdictions and charters for various financial institutions. The result is that charter arbitrage and people looking for the least painful regulatory environment has created systems where I think there are weaker spots across the lay of the land as a result of people choosing regulators that were more hospitable as opposed to maybe more challenging to them. And so the preference I would have would be for a, a, a basic effort to, to shrink the number of available charters so that it's clear and having a much stronger overall prudential regulator. So step one would be to have basically some type of market risk or systemic regulator. Step two would be to organize in a more efficient way prudential regulation across different types of institutions. And the third would be that we have to get a system that brings confidence back to the consumer and investor protection area. Uh, and hopefully that would be by, by driving hard uh, with an enhanced SEC uh, type organization. Um, I, I think that uh, we can talk about the different ways when one thinks and probably the one that's getting the most attention today is the idea of a systemic risk regulator. Here I think it should be, from my point of view, there's several choices. My preference is the Federal Reserve Board should be the person that should do that. It could be that if the Fed takes on this responsibility, they should be divest some of the current responsibilities they have so that a Fed that focuses on fewer things but has the additional responsibility of a systemic risk regulator. Um, I, I think that, uh, in conclusion, that we're hearing lots of different issues um, about um, from these, the regulators and supervisors, and, and there's also coming to, to be a belief that we really have to have a much clearer view of the non-bank financial institutions. If they, as they become closer to banks, they basically have such importance within the system that we have to have a clearer line of sight on them. The exact methodology by which this is accomplished is open for debate, but I think that's become a, a pretty strong view. Let me leave it there, if I can, uh, and basically just conclude on an optimistic note that uh, you know, the ni United States is clearly facing lots of challenges uh, today with regard to economic policy uh, and public policy, uh, but I'm quite optimistic. Uh, one of the people I like to read is Warren Buffett, and in this year he reminded in his letter that in the last 100 years that we suffered through two world wars, uh, a dozen recessions, and a Great Depression in which unemployment exceeded 25%. Now, given that backdrop, uh, that the standard of living for Americans in the 20th century improved sevenfold. So there's the ability to work through these things and be stronger from it, and that should be our goal. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I suggest we go uh, through with uh, comments from each panelist first, and then we'll come back to those I thought I would give the perspective of the private sector in response to some of the things that were just said. There are three players today, Congress, the administration, and Wall Street. And at least between the administration and Wall Street, I think there's a consensus first that we will not have recovery until we restore the financial structure and confidence in the financial system. And unless we do that, we're going to slow down recovery because credit must flow and there must be investor confidence that these institutions are safe and sound. The administration 
and Wall Street have also ruled out to date nationalization. I think for two reasons. One, the institutions are so large that no institution of comparable size has ever been nationalized before. One talks about Sweden, one talks about continental Illinois. They don't compare to the global operations that the banks that would be the subject of nationalization would have to go. Secondly, if the banks were nationalized, the government might not be able to realize value when it turned it back over to the private sector as it did with continental Illinois. Another thing that's been ruled out is simply buying the assets. One of the problems we have today is confidence in banks continues to erode because no one has any confidence that the assets on the balance sheet are still fairly valued. So why doesn't the government simply buy them out? Well, there's no consensus that that could work for two reasons. One, how would they be priced? And secondly, what would the knock-on effects be for other organizations owning comparable assets? So we did conclude that we would have a program that would make investments in financial institutions that could use help with respect to their capital adequacy. Now, nationalization in some ways would have been much more crisp. It would have, in a sense, addressed the problems, said this bank has to be nationalized, could be turned around. The trouble with the investments that have been made is that they haven't necessarily solved the problem of investor confidence because there's still a perception of the money has gone into the banks. They haven't addressed a fundamental issue as to what the real value of their balance sheet is. So initially, the idea was that we would bring the government to bear as an investor, but everyone should be brought to the table. So not just institutions that clearly were in financial difficulty, but others that might not necessarily need it were encouraged to participate in the TARP program. So that's why it wasn't trying to single out that you and you and you must have it because without it you couldn't survive. It was the idea that this is going to help out the system and provide liquidity. But there were some key assumptions in place. One is that the rules of the road would be set out in the legislation and that companies would continue to be run by management, even though it might be replaced, notwithstanding what the government's equity ownership would be. And that was the approach that was also taken in the UK with Royal Bank of Scotland. As someone mentioned, they own 80% plus, but they are going to let that run as a private company with management. And the thought was, this has to be a partnership. You cannot have the government do it by itself. Wall Street clearly can't do it by itself, so we'll have it as a partnership going forward. The problem is the response of the Congress to AIG has changed all this. Because Congress made it clear that it wants to be deeply involved in how these funds are spent. It wants to oversee its implementation. And two things happened. What did Congress focus on? The bonus payments. And what was its reaction? To enact at the House a prohibitive tax legislation that any institution receiving TARP funds if it paid out more than $250,000 to any employee, 90% of that excess would be taxed. And secondly, it raised questions as to, to whom AIG made payments. The government invested money so AIG would not fail as a counterparty to important institutions in the world. AID just does that. It made payments it was obligated to make under its counterparty agreements. And what did the Congress say? My God, we made payments to French banks. It's terrible to a French bank. Why did that go forward? Again, this idea that if aid goes in, it should only be for U.S. institutions, it should only be for U.S. counterparties, it should not look at what the global operations would be. So as a result, if you are a TARP company now, what have, can you expect? One, whatever you do will be under enormous scrutiny by the Congress. And it won't just be compensation. It will be expenditures including travel, entertainment, offsites, all things that are necessary to run an organization. Secondly, one would have to expect that all major initiatives would be cleared by the government because of the congressional oversight. So therefore, a company may think that an acquisition may be in its best interest, a share repurchase, a significant diversification. That is not likely to be done without consulting with the government, taking into account congressional oversight. And third, whether or not the government votes, and the government has taken the view that it won't necessarily vote its shares, if you have a 38% shareholder, whether or not it votes, 
you're going to consult that shareholder to be sure that whatever you do is consistent with what it views its goals would be. And remember, the government wants to exit these investments to make some sort of profit for the shareholders. What are we going to need then to go forward, at least from the private sector point of view? We must have clear rules of the road. And we must be careful that if we don't have clear and fair rules of the road, the most disastrous thing that could happen would be TARP participants who have received income funding to pull out of the program. That would leave only the most vulnerable institutions left. That would create investor issues of self-confidence, and it could create a cascading effect that we should worry about, and it wouldn't necessarily help credit flow. It might, in fact, have it dry up. We must also address the question of whether we limit investment funds to only U.S. operations. Most of these institutions that have received funding have global obligations and global presence, and we can't simply have rules that ring fence where the funds can be. I can't emphasize enough that as a consequence of con congressional outrage, imagine if you were an AIZ executive in Connecticut and a bus comes from Hartford and it pulls by where you live and the bus stops and people get out and knock on your door to yell. And since you don't answer the door, they leave all kinds of inflammatory letters in your mailbox. Uh, or if you're summoned down to testify, as Liddy was, here's someone who's serving for a dollar a year, and you're castigated by a Congress who pretends it had nothing to contribute or was no way responsible went on. Morale is basically um, devastated at most institutions because they don't know what the ground rules are going to be. And that's going to affect the private partnership as well, because a private investor is going to go in if the rules will change down the road if they make too much money. Wall Street gets the need for regulatory change, as you laid out, and it will participate going forward. But it has to be fair, it has to be balanced, it has to be a partnership. And my concern is that Congress, yielding to popular outrage, may interfere with what is essential, and that is to get this regulatory system changed, to get confidence back in the system, and to get credit flowing again. Thank you, Ed. Uh, <clears throat> we'll turn to Craig uh, Burnside. Um, so I, before going into any more details, I just want to say one thing straight off the bat, which is just that, you know, the system in a sense is working. The government is actually doing what it's supposed to do in this sort of situation. You know, we, we might not like the cost to us as the taxpayer. We might be mad at the bankers. We might be mad at the regulators. We might be mad at, you know, think that there's problems with the details of the, of the um, policy response to the crisis. But the bottom line is the government is doing exactly what a government does in a financial crisis, which is intervene. And they intervene because they have to. Uh, modern market economies simply can't function without a financial system. And, um, you know, that's sort of Econ 101. Um, and there's a reason everybody's talking about getting the banks lending again. It's because without banks lending, the day-to-day -day activity of the economy, never mind, you know, sort of longer-term growth and investment, simply can't happen. All of that being said, you know, of course, how governments best respond to the crisis is an open question, and that's the topic today. Um, when we're debating whether banks should be nationalized or not, we're debating one aspect of that, of that policy response. Any kind of policy response to financial crisis kind of addresses it in two ways. One is simply to kind of stem the panic, right? It's just to keep the economy functioning in the short term. And the other part of the policy response is more about sort of medium and longer term aspects of how the financial sector is going to recover. Um, on the panic side, there's a, there's a passage from, uh, from Walter Badgett's Lombard Street that's been quoted a lot um, in the past months by various commentators. And, and in this quote, he, in this passage, he quotes one of the directors of the Bank of England um, on how the bank panic of 1825 was stopped. And uh, this director says, we lent money by every possible means and in modes we have never adopted before. We took stock on security, we purchased exchequer bills, we made advances on exchequer bills, we not only discounted outright, but we made advances on deposit of bills of exchange to an immense amount, in short, by every means consistent with the safety of the bank. Uh, 
evidently not much has changed in 200 years. That pretty much captures the essence of the Federal Reserve's response to, to the crisis, and, and rightly so. First and foremost, keep liquidity flowing, stem the panic, and do that by any means necessary. The problem is that stemming the panic itself kind of creates a problem for the functioning of the banks. Because there's an aspect of stemming the panic that's basically about giving a blanket guarantee to the depositors and the debt holders of the banks. And when you do that, you create a, what economists call a debt overhang problem, which essentially works like this. Suppose you have a bank and there's this new profitable loan opportunity that it faces. And there's two states of the world, one in which the bank would fail, you know, that's sort of the, where some of its assets are bad and there's a good state of the world. The bank has to pay the upfront cost of making the loan regardless of which of these two states of the world gets realized. But if there's a guarantee on the bank, if the government's just going to take the bank over and bail out the, the deposit holders and the bond holders in the bad state of the world, then the shareholders don't benefit from, from that loan being made. And so the bank doesn't make it. There's no reason for it to make it. And so this is part of the problem of getting lending going again is simply that a bank doesn't function correctly when you have this blanket guarantee. So how, do, how does the government kind of get around this problem? Well, basically the different ways it does it is by eliminating the bad state of the world, the state of the world in which the bank actually fails. Um, and there are many ways the government can do that. It can buy the bad assets of the banks. It can provide insurance to people who are willing to buy the bad assets of the banks. Or it can just inject capital into the banks in exchange for equity stakes. And these are the various kinds of proposals that have been bandied around since the beginning of the crisis. Nationalization is part of that picture. It's just an extreme form of the third solution. You just inject enough capital that you basically take over all the equity of the bank. The, the existing shareholders get diluted. And of course, we've seen the, the, the government do this in the cases of uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, um, AIG, obviously, and to some extent, uh, the plans announced for Citigroup in, in February had a bit of this flavor. Um, but, you know, repeatedly, people have avoided this dirty word called nationalization and insisted that that's not what we're going to do with the banks. Um, partly, I think that's just because the government running something like a bank seems kind of un-American. Um, most analysts seem to think it's politically unacceptable. Um, but when the government's throwing trillions of dollars at the banking system to try and shore it up, you know, it's tempting to ask whether, in fact, this might be the right solution. And certainly lots of economists, prominent economists like Paul Krugman and Joseph Stiglitz have been arguing that, in fact, this is exactly what we should do. And in fact, Alan Greenspan has suggested that maybe it's what we might need to do. But it's important to keep in mind that what these, you know, what, even what the advocates of nationalization have in mind isn't something where we would permanently nationalize the banks. Okay? They're talking about temporary nationalization. The international track record on having a government-run banking system or a, a banking system where state ownership of banks is a, is a major feature is not good. Generally speaking, it means lower growth, lower financial development more generally, more concentration in lending, less competition, more banking crises, lots of bad stuff, basically. So this isn't something that we want to, that we want to get into. Some developed countries have a, have a better experience with nationalized banks, mostly countries in Europe, but we don't have any experience of having a state-owned banking system. And so I don't think that's something that we really want to contemplate getting into. But temporary nationalization is a different matter. You know, basically what it means is that, you know, the government, by taking these equity stakes, can minimize the cost to taxpayers of each of the alternate mechanisms for bailing out the banks that I mentioned earlier. You know, so you could buy the bad assets. The problems with that are well known. The problem with buying the bad assets is you don't, you could end up overpaying. But if you just at the same time dilute the existing shareholder stakes in the banks, well, then the cost to the government, you know, if the government overpays, well, that's, that's fine, but it ends, up owning, it ends up owning the bank. So if the bank ends up being worth something because it overpaid for these, 
these bad assets. The government's the beneficiary, not the existing shareholders. The same in the case of providing insurance to people who are willing to buy the bad assets. Again, you could increase your equity stake in the bank at the same time if you sort of over provide the insurance or sell the insurance too cheaply. The sort of outright nationalization option is just another one, another one like that. Of course it wipes out the existing shareholders, so it's not surprising that existing shareholders are the loudest voices being heard complaining about the idea of nationalization. Um, you know, how would the government handle this? Well, the government has to, if the government nationalizes banks, it has to act as if it's a, a regular shareholder. It has to act as if what it wants the banks to do is maximize profits. It can't get involved in all the bad stuff that happens in countries where there's a big state-owned banking system. It can't politically interfere in lending. So I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other on whether nationalization is a real option. In some cases, it will just probably, it may end up being necessary. Um, but it's certainly an option that as taxpayers, we should probably have some interest in the government considering because it's certainly probably the option that would minimize the cost to, to, uh, to taxpayers. I think the big challenge in the longer term is figuring out how to do regulation in such a way that we minimize the probability of one of these crises taking place. You know, I did point out at the very beginning the government's doing exactly what governments do in crises. They intervene and um, they bail out the banking system. And the problem is that put option on the taxpayer is something that requires regulation that avoids the occurrence of the put option ever being exercised. And uh, that's, my long, that's my bigger concern going forward. Well, first of all, I want to uh, greet all you fellow uh, AIG and Citigroup stockholders. And uh, it's an honor for me to address you about uh, the matter that's on the top of our uh, agenda, and that is uh, how are we going to get our money back? Uh, and more importantly, the question is, what strategy? And I think that's what you wanted me to address. What strategy uh, are we going to apply to get our money back? But let's, let's work through this. I mean, because uh, I think that part of the idea about um, nationalization uh, and it is what Craig was talking about, uh, and that is uh, the, the long history of nationalized banks is not, a, is not a good one, and it's because they start using the banks for all kinds of reasons other than banking purposes. Uh, so uh, let's just think about some of the ways in which we could think about getting our money back. One is, one is, is that we, uh, let's take AIG for an example. We could think about selling it off in little appendages here and there. And there's a couple of question marks there. Uh, one is, who's going to buy it? I mean, even though you have a, you know, a profitable division that's not filled with toxic assets uh, and you could spin it off, think about the consequences of that. If it's a stock deal, that is, that whoever's going to buy it from AIG is going to give stock, their stock, to the holders of AIG, that means they then have a substantial governmental interest in their company. If you own 85% of AIG, you own 85% of every division of AIG. And so unless somebody who's going to buy them is mammoth, uh, you're going to have a substantial government presence and you're just going to... So this is a little bit like playing old maid. You probably don't want to... Uh, I hope that's not politically incorrect to refer to that game. But, uh, you know, it, it, so the other idea is, that, well, okay, so we're not going to sell off this appendage in AIG for stock. Uh, we'll do it for cash. Well, that means somebody's got to have a lot of cash or it's got to be a very different market that we're working in right now. Uh, and quite likely down the road, maybe there will be cash there uh, and this will look pretty attractive. So. Um, uh, we ought to be thinking that this exit strategy is probably going to go down the road. Uh, another strategy is that, well, we'll just have one hell of a big public offering. Uh, we'll sell in the marketplace our shares that we have in AIG and probably we'll do it in stages and um, uh, be able to unload it there. But the question then becomes, why would you and I want to buy it? Well, we want to buy it if we thought it was a pretty good deal. 
uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, so all of this, whether we're thinking about uh, uh, somebody buying appendages or selling us all off in the block, depends on the value of that AIG stock looking pretty good. And the reason it's going to look pretty good or Citigroup's going to look pretty good is because we've done a pretty good job of managing this firm. So the question about, to, and answer your question, Lawrence, about what is the role of the government representatives on AIG's board or what are the representatives of, on Citigroup's board, uh, certainly you'd like to have them be just like directors at other places that seek a motive of maximizing the value of the firm, pursuing profitable opportunities, things that are in the interest of the corporation, and not the interest of you know, uh, fringe political groups that capture the ear of Congress. Uh, and so the fear that I have uh, with the nationalization or substantial nationalization of AIG or the substantial investment that we've had to make, and I think we're totally rational in making, uh, in banks is the fear that the normal functioning of pursuing profit maximization within a sustainable framework for the company uh, will be sacrificed from time to time uh, out of political pressures that get placed uh, upon the board of directors representing the public ownership. And so we will find the, the history repeating itself here. Um, one would hope we're able to steer clear of that uh, and keep our eye on the ball, which is we want our money back, and the best way to do that is to make those companies successful so that they either can be sold in whole or their appendages can be uh, broken off in sensible parts and recoup some of the money. And hopefully that will happen soon. Okay. Um, let me respond. Yeah, I think let me respond in a few categories. First, talking about banks. Um, the term nationalization, I think, is a misnomer. Um, at least so far, uh, the government is not actually managing the banks. And um, I think that the situation is much closer to that of a loan workout, where a creditor typically would take equity with the intention of selling it once stock prices rise. I think that's closer to what the government is considering. Um, Few people, I imagine, would believe that the government can do a better job at running our banks than the private sector. Uh, let me also distinguish um, the issue of solvency and zombie banks. Uh, people have talked about, solve, about zombie banks as insolvent banks. Insolvent can mean that the book value of the assets is less than the liabilities, which may well be true for some banks, but to that extent, it's largely due, I think, to the plummeting value of security investments by the banks um, in various mortgage-backed and other securities. And part of that plummeting value, I would, at least I've seen uh, based on some uh, research, is actually, and I think others will, will confirm this, although people have questions, uh, is really due to uh, the market prices of these mortgage-backed securities being much lower in some cases than the actual intrinsic value of those securities. If you look at the underlying obligors, the mortgagors, and look at what they're expected to pay. Um, in any event, um, I would say that some banks may be insolvent on a balance sheet basis, but as long as they don't need to sell their mortgage-backed securities or other securities now to pay their liabilities, hopefully the market prices will ultimately rise and they'll be able to pay their debts as they come due, which is a more dynamic definition of solvency. Now, I also want to talk about near banks. Um, we've all heard about this, like investment banks, AIG. And essentially here, um, I wouldn't distinguish traditional deposit-taking banks from near banks um, uh, like these ent entities. I think the key principle here is that size matters. If you're a large financial institution and your collapse can trigger a potential systemic collapse of the financial system, then I think regulation is potentially in order. Um, and in terms of regulation, uh, one of the concerns we have is too big to fail and the fact that some of these institutions can actually manipulate uh, the government into, into subsidizing them. And this is something I believe that I'm, I may be asked the question later about, 
about a market liquidity provider, and I'll talk about that. Uh, let me also go back to Bob Steele's comment that how extraordinary it is that the collapse of financial institutions led to problems in the real economy. Often it's the other way around. And to this extent, I would simply add that it wasn't that the collapse of financial institutions wasn't really the the first trigger. I think the first trigger was the collapse of the financial markets. And the I would focus more, uh, well not more, but I would focus in addition to on banks on trying to protect financial markets. No, very few people realize that financial markets have been replacing banks as drivers of credit, a phenomenon known as disintermediation. In recent years, it's been reported that about 70% of credit comes from financial markets, especially securization, not from bank deposits or banks per se. And it's the collapse of the financial markets that has virtually killed the availability of credit and the availability of credit being lacking has really created the real economy. So I would say we need to more systematically study financial markets and their regulation. Um, the other thing I should just mention is the whole issue of systemic risk. And I've looked a lot of it, studied it at, at some depth. I think there are three general problems from a regulatory standpoint, and they apply to banks be they nationalized or not. There's the problem of complacency, the fact that whatever we say, institutions, human beings are going to make mistakes in their investments. People are herd animals. Uh, if it turns out that one institution is doing some, investing in some product or doing something, others might copy it. Also, people have an over-reliance on simplifying heuristics. You don't want to look at a 400-page prospectus of what some complex so-called ABS CDO security is all about. You just want to look at the fact that Moody's rated it AAA, and that's a mistake. And also that people have short memories, that it's been shown that once crises sort of dissipate, people sort of look to um, the so-called go for the gold, they go for the where the money is. And this is something, I'm not sure how to regulate complexity, but it's something we need to come to grips with. A second sort of problem is conflicts, conflicts of interest. And this comes up in many ways, but I'll simply mention briefly that scholars have studied extensively conflicts between boards of directors and CEOs of companies. No one has really studied so far issues of conflicts among secondary managers, even analysts of companies. And this is very problematic. Uh, some of you may know that, for example, the VAR model, value at risk, was used by some analysts to convince senior management that investments being made would generate a nice income but would have no risk. And that was a flaw of the model. And the conflict of interest where the analyst would get a bonus, uh, and if the company went down the tubes in a number of years, the analyst may not even be there, that was problematic. And the third problem, which uh, Lawrence had mentioned, is a problem of complexity, both in institutions, which Lawrence is studying, and in financial markets, which I'm studying. And I think this is one of the most difficult problems of the 21st century. Um, as a recent, you know, the current crisis has shown, investors don't always understand what they invest in, and even underwriters don't always understand what they're selling. So uh, these are some thoughts for now, and I'll hold off on the market liquidity provider issue for a few minutes. Thank you, Steve. I think that those were a number of very good points, and I, I feel that uh, I feel that we can we can all agree on one thing: lending is important to our economy, and lending is lending is so critical that. Uh, that uh, we're, we're now seeing it being brought to its knees. And so I thought, and it, it, Lawrence has asked me to, to take us on a, a walk through where lending comes from. And this is, this, I almost feel like I'm, uh, I'm uh, for many people, I, I, I think everyone realizes that lending comes from banks. And that's easy. You go to a bank, you take out a loan, and, and, uh, and uh, you, you, you apply the money appropriately. There's another part of where lending comes from. It's, it's generally these days referred to as the shadow banking system. 
Uh, this is the part of the system that we're actually trying to save right now. This is the the uh, the uh, public-private partnership program that was announced on Monday is trying to save it. The uh, TALF program is trying to save this part of the system. In fact, this system dwarfs the banking system. The, uh, so I'd like to, for, to ask each one of you to join me on a slippery slope as we slide down the shadow banking system and it was cr its creation. The shadow banking system, in many respects, the first participant in the shadow banking system was our own government. The, our, our own government uh, borrowed money directly from the markets. It borrowed money directly from people like you and me. It borrowed money directly from mutual funds. It did not go to banks. It was, went around banks. That was the shadow banking system. Next part of the shadow banking system can be seen in, in corporations. Corporations go out and they borrow loans, they borrow, take down long-term debt, they take down commercial paper, they take down all sorts of things by accessing the markets directly without directly going to banks. But corporations, unlike the government, also do go to banks. The, when they do go to banks, the banks do one of two things. The banks can either keep the corporate loan on their own books, or the bank can say, I've got too much risk to this corporation, and let me push some of this money out the, the back door. I will either syndicate that loan, or I'll sell participations in that loan. That was the early stages, and ultimately they got to packaging the, these loans into, uh, into other products and put them together into a corporation, a special purpose vehicle, and, and sent them on their way onto the, onto the financial sea and, 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 and sold their, their loans that way. Um, that was uh, the shadow banking system on the back end of banks. Banks were no longer involved. They were no longer on hook on, on the loans that they had. The interesting thing was that the more that this happened, the banks did not have to keep the loans on their books. They realized that by selling them off, they could actually make new loans. They sold them off, got new money, could make new loans. As soon as they sold something else off, they could make new loans. And the, 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 the pattern was that by doing all these banking deals, they got to collect fees, and they sold them off and got to do it again. So, so it's a wonderful uh, process. We also see this happen with mortgages. And mortgages we'll spend a little bit more time on because I think it's, it, it really goes to the very heart of some of the problems that we're facing today. When individuals wanted to take out a mortgage, they went to their local bank. Unlike the days where you had Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life telling people that, uh, that uh, you know, someone's deposit is in someone else's house, that, that's no longer the case. Someone's, uh, uh, the, the lending money uh, for houses today comes from a, a hedge fund. The lending money comes from a mutual fund, uh, all through the magic of, of uh, securitization. This was facilitated by the banks. They were able not to keep that mortgage, but Fannie and Freddie came along and said, we can take that mortgage off of your hands. We'll buy that mortgage from you. So they sold that mortgage to Fannie and Freddie. And the next thing you know, Fannie and Freddie says, oh, and once these mortgages are paid off, we'll buy some more mortgages from you. And then they thought, Fannie and Freddie thought, well, we don't have to wait for these mortgages to pay, be paid off to buy more mortgages from you. We should go sell these mortgages ourselves. And we'll have more money so we can buy the mortgages off faster from you. So they created mortgage-backed securities. They took the pool of mortgages, they sold them into the market, and, and people bought them. People liked mortgage-backed securities. Why? Because they actually had a higher yield than a normal, a 30-year mortgage on average had a higher yield than a 30-year treasury. In fact, if it was sold by Fannie and Freddie, it had uh, the implied guarantee of the U.S. government. Why was it a higher yield? The reason it was a higher yield was because these mortgages, you had the right to prepay them. And people don't fully appreciate you know, the right to prepay. They could be paid off. When they are paid off, they're paid off at the wrong time. You know, a high interest rate mortgage is great for an investor, but it's bad for the borrower. And so when the borrower tries to pay it off as soon as they can, they pay it off as soon as rates fall. And when rates fall, this is the very time when that lender doesn't want to be prepaid on this mortgage. That lender now has, is, has, a, has a pile of cash that they need to put back out into the market, but rates have fallen in the meantime, so the lender is getting less of a yield. So 
why would anyone want to buy that thing? They wouldn't want to buy it unless it had a higher rate on it to start with. So mortgages have higher rates. They're good additions to portfolios. Then people who had big portfolios of mortgages realized that they had prepayment risk, and sometimes that prepayment risk was very hard to manage. Fannie and Freddie came to the rescue again. They created collateralized uh, mortgage obligations that allowed them to slice and dice that same mortgage pool that they sold overall, but they sliced it and they said, well, we'll put the prepayments in this one slice. The first prepayments go in this one slice, second set of prepayments here, and finally all the way down, the last set of prepayments go into another slice. It was the same mortgage portfolio, but they sliced it up. So you could sort of get your own, your own medicine as to whether you want soon prepayment or late prepayment. That was a financial innovation. It allowed people to manage their mortgage portfolios more carefully. It allowed them to reduce the risk. In doing so, guess what? Mortgages became easier and less risky to invest in. So what happens? More people pile in by virtue of financial innovation. So we got more people in the door. Just as CMOs allowed people to come into the door and do more mortgages, we had interest rate swaps allowed people to come in and manage their interest rate risk uh, more, more accurately. Again, by reducing risk, it enables people to borrow more. It's not as risky to borrow. So, so borrowing goes up because of that. Then along come credit default swaps and allow people to manage the credit risk that they have with one company and another. And so because it allows people to manage their credit, they can take off more, they can take on more exposure. It's easier to push your credit, you know, the credit risk offshore. So now all of a sudden, again, the market starts growing more and more and more. Now subprime, that takes us to subprime. Subprime was this area of mortgage, uh, mortgages that didn't go through the Fannie Freddie system. It didn't because Fannie Freddie had basic quality standards. And, but yet, subprimes, banks would take on subprime loans or maybe the money store or places like that might take on uh, uh, sub, subprime loans. Um, but they would bank them to themselves and they, there would be this small market where they would maybe discount those mortgages out among themselves. But they weren't guaranteed by Fannie Freddie. They just stayed off on the side. And then someone got the bright idea. They sort of realized, you know, the average pool of subprime mortgages, maybe 75% of them never, ever default. 75% never, ever default. Well, great. Why don't we take the lesson from the CMO uh, uh, world, and instead of slicing it about prepayment, let's slice it by default. So they, they took a bunch of subprime mortgages and they said, we're putting the high credit quality up here, we're putting the low credit quality down here. You could decide if you want to buy the high credit quality stuff, the stuff that's almost certain going to be paid off because we think that 75% of these things are going to be paying, being paid off, or you can buy this other stuff. And by the way, Moody's and S&P is going to rate this top group AAA. Guess what now? All of a sudden, people who, people who are only buying Fannie and Freddie mortgages were now buying these other mortgages, these subprime mortgages and th that were packaged in these things called CDOs. And in fact, people who weren't even buying mortgages at all were buying CDOs. Everyone was getting into it. It was, it was just too easy to get too much extra yield by buying something that someone called AAA. The money flowed in. Subprime was off to the races. In fact, all of a sudden now that subprime, subprime, this sort of this, this stepchild had, had all of a sudden become the, the, the darling child, that uh, it, it, had, it had much higher yields. And, and so let's throw more money into this. And, and now people, people uh, uh, decided to push more money into it. So much money was pushed into this that mortgage brokers were going out there saying, begging people, take my money, please. Let me help you buy a new house. Let me help you. Uh, refinance your credit card debt. Let me help you. I've got money coming out my pockets. In fact, it's coming. It is so easy. I will give you a teaser rate. I'll, I'll let you pay only 1% interest for the first uh, so many years. And you, 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 you know, the, this is the land of milk and honey. People took those things down. And you know something? They could afford them. A lot of times today we hear people uh, talking about, well, someone got into mortgages that they couldn't afford. You know something? They could afford these things. And they were told, and you know, when the teaser rate's over and the big rate, the big bump up rate comes, we can refinance. I got good news for you. We'll give you another teaser rate. And who knows, it may even be a better teaser rate. 
And so they sucked more and more people into this market and the money kept flowing into this market. And then something started happening. A few things started happening at once. The market was getting saturated. The market was getting saturated. Housing prices had been bid up through, this, through all this liquidity that was being pushed in there and allowing people to buy houses. And the thing was starting to top off. And at this point, um, at this point, um, the, the markets actually started, uh, started to pause. Real estate prices no longer were going up. Um, people um, who, had, who took down mortgages with uh, low tier, teaser rates um, uh, now had their mortgages being, uh, uh, being reevaluated as the rates increased. Housing prices stable, markets sort of getting slower. They couldn't get refinancing. They then ended up with high rates of interest and they could not afford those rates of interest so they, they were left with two choices, sell your house or default. They tried to sell the houses, they couldn't sell them fast enough and that sort of pushed uh, housing prices down. And then the default rates go up and all these things that were rated uh, AAA, you can't have AAA that's defaulting. So the, the, the downgrades started coming fast and furious. And so now we're left with, now that took us on the slippery slope to the point where, where, where we have a lot of this AAA paper is no longer AAA. Um, the, uh, the papers become junk. And a lot of that paper was held by banks. Why? Because the banks drank their own Kool-Aid. They believed that it was, that it was magic. They believed that AAA paper that paid more than other AAA paper was it was right. It was, you know, it was, it was, it was paid there for, for one reason or another, but it was, it was free money. So um, no one, because no one knew how bad the economy uh, would get, they didn't have two important pieces of information needed to price this paper. And this sort of brings us to where we are right now. Number one, they didn't know how many people would start defaulting. No one knew how bad the defaulting would get. And it would be one thing, you'd be happy with your mortgages if no one was defaulting, you don't care what the prices were. If everyone was paying off their mortgage, you don't care. But so the question was, would 80% uh, uh, pay, 20% default, would 50% default, would 40% default, would 30% default? This is why we had these toxins, this is why these assets are toxic. And if they default, then you have the second problem because you're not gonna get paid the cash flow, you're gonna get paid the price of the real estate, because that's all you're going to get on foreclosure. And then that brings the, the question to the fore of how much is real estate going to go down? If real estate goes down 60% the way it did in Japan in, this, in the 90s, and some parts in Japan went down 70, 80%, then, and if mortgages were only 80% of the people on these mortgages were defaulting, you've got a pretty bad piece of paper. And so that leads us to what we what was uh, proposed with this public-private partnership uh, at the beginning, at the beginning of the week, these pieces of paper are actually really easy to price, as long as you know what the default rate is, and you know what the home prices are. But because you don't know either one of those until you really know either one of those, you can't price it. I don't care what anybody tells you; you just can't price it. And so when we look at this public-private partnership and we look at how the uh, government is, is trying to set up a, a program to, to buy back this debt, the question is, will the people who want to buy it back, will they have enough certainty in the default rate and in the home prices that will allow them to put in a good bid that the banks will want to sell at? And if that doesn't happen, if that doesn't happen, if there's a spread, a gap between these two groups, then we'll be back here, we'll be talking about, do we nationalize the banks or do we uh, go through uh, a whole restructuring? Thank you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> that's a tangled web and it uh, is, I think, uh, something that provides a great backdrop for why this is so intractable. I, we have time for questions and I'm gonna kick this off by asking um, Bob a question relating to a, something he suggested, which was in the context of charter arbitrage. There are, we have a century-old system of dual banking. We have insurance companies that are re regulated by the states, not by the federal 
government agencies, and um, a commissioner of state banks, who I'm sure he would not mind me saying this, I invited him to be here and he said, I've got to be up in Washington to save the state banking system today, well, I'd love to be here. Uh, is this crisis bad enough that we will break through that? Because it seems harder than gun control. <laughs> Well, uh, I think there's some signs of progress if you buy my point of view that we would, for large, important institutions that provide similar activities, we should um, regulate and supervise the activity, not the nature of the charter. So what you do matters, not who you are. And so I think that's kind of the concept. And we've had a couple of examples. I think that uh, there was a regime born um, just a very few years ago um, for supervising broker-dealers, the large broker-dealers, uh, where the SEC took responsibility to be the consolidated supervising entity for the large broker-dealers. And the chairman of the SEC said in Congress that he didn't think that had been successful. So the result has been that, that all the remaining large broker-dealers have become bank holding companies, so that's solved. So I, I think that we would benefit from having a, for large important institutions, uh, that. Uh, depository institutions, to start with, I would uh, propose one large, strong OCC-like entity, um, point one. Point two, I, I believe, and this was something we spoke about in the Treasury Blueprint, that you should offer a, an optional federal charter for insurance. And the more large, important financial institutions in the insurance industry that would be under the web, uh, under the, the review of a federal insurance charter, I think that would be better than state charters. Mm -hmm. And it would be better for consumers also. Uh, where you know the fact that insurance stops at state lines and has to be different uh, means that consumers pay a higher price and, and that's and have less choice so I think they would benefit from that too and I guess that uh, process has occurred already with the traditional depository institutions where state banks have been effectively curbed by those standards and by a federal deposit insurance and right um, Ed uh, you talked about the, ch the rules changing all the time uh, from the business point of view but the reality is the, the, the political uh, context is that p the public has a five-minute attention span and we're going to react to bonus issues relating to AIG and congressmen are going to react to what they hear from their, their constituents. Uh, is there some way we can get this out of that political arena? Um, do you see some uh, sort of a, a smoke-filled room method of uh, getting at this problem uh, like it used to happen in the old days or was it uh, too late for that? That's a fair question. Probably the way to get at it is to put in to place such issue as this, we'll limit leverage. We will um, limit proprietary trading, which has been suggested by the Group of 30. We'll require in securitization that you have some skin in the game, for example, so that you're not in laying off risks that you haven't really vetted and then try to tell the Congress and the people is that we're sensitive to what's happened. We've tried to put in some constraints with respect to this. We are gonna regulate the shadow banking system, but what we can't do is second guess day-to-day -day business decisions by people trying to run large organizations. I think what got people so upset was that if every significant expenditure made by Citigroup or J.P. Morgan Chase or Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley would be subject to a hearing in which you were summoned down to be excoriated, why would you participate in that program unless you were desperate? And that's what we have to avoid. So the way to avoid it is for legislation to come through, the systemic regulator, but also we can put constraints in place because they have been recommended, not just in the United States, but in Europe as well, and then say, we've addressed it. We've got governance in place. We've got compensation limitations in place. Now go run it so you can maximize the value for us as a government shareholder as well as the existing shareholders. Yeah. I, I had not realized just how far-reaching the regulation of business judgment had reached until the paper I was reading that Lisa Broom has written. Um, I had read the press reports about some of the details, but in fact, if the government chose to exercise those powers uh, strictly, and politics might drive that, it is just a, a, astonishing what the government can now do to control. You know, we saw JP Morgan the other day having to abandon its plans to refurbish its airplane hangar. Um, so uh, I guess you're right, and the question is how do we get away from that atmosphere where that's the demand. I'm going to pause for a moment and look to see if anybody in the audience has a question. Uh, yes. Yes, well, if you would come round to the microphone. Thank you. 
directed at anybody in particular, but just from your perspective, what are some either financial or economic indicators that can in, that actually demonstrate we're moving away from the current tar turmoil? Is it you know housing, home foreclosures in, uh, decreasing? Is it new loans being processed? Um, are there you know basic economic indicators regarding GDP or inventories going down that we can look at? Just you know we, we've talked a lot about where we are right now, but how do we did start to demonstrate that we're starting to move away from the current crisis? <laughs> and the economist will start That's right. <laughs> make an assumption. Yeah. <laughs> and give several alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, was just, uh, I was just in Italy last week speaking at um, an event about the financial crisis, and they asked me, is it going to be V shaped, U shaped, or L shaped? And the other guy said, U shaped. So, and one of them said, L shaped. So I said, shaped. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, would, I wouldn't go out and bet any money on anything I say here, but, I, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of uh, indicators that you, can, that you can look at to see if um, the economy is turning around, and I think one of the things that I would look to is, is sort of the business investment sector, because in the initial stages of the recession, um, the main place that we saw the economy tanking was in was in uh, residential investment. You know, every recession is a period where investment drops significantly, much more than consumption or you know government spending or something like that. So, um, but in the, in this particular recession, it was largely confined up until the last few months to uh, residential investment, and it's only been in the sort of the last quarter that other business investment started to fall. So I think if that comes back, uh, rather than continuing to fall, that would be a very good, uh, that would be a very good indicator. And there's monthly indicators of that published by the Federal Reserve. Um, you know, there's been good news in the last two weeks on s the stock market and so forth, but you can't interpret every two week movement in the stock market. Do that at your peril. So. And my comment would be a shorter and more, a little less specific. I think it's three things, time, confidence, and capital. And basically, this is a recession. It takes a while for these processes to work themselves through. Number two, confidence. Uh, people have to believe there's a plan. Uh, um, the quote I gave from Warren Buffett, we can work through these things. And right now, you're seeing the president step to the front and say, I'm going to try to, try to encourage confidence. And that's what he's been doing. A and I think the third is capital, which is really what this conference is about, is that where's the capital come to make sure the institutions stay strong as we work through this. So I think about it as time, confidence, and capital, and watch each of those to see where you think we are in the cycle. Uh, Mr. Steele, this would be for you. I was particularly interested in your comments given that you've had experience both in the private sector and public service. If I understood your prescription, it was to perhaps create a super regulator and to enhance the regulatory authority of the Federal Reserve. If we go back to Dean Levy's question at the beginning of the forum, which is why didn't anyone see this coming, I'm not sure that we could say that the regulators actually acquitted themselves very well in this crisis. I think that one can certainly fault the SEC for being asleep at the switch when it comes to the Madoff scandal and others. And I think one can question the Federal Reserve's intuition that, for example, the repeal of Glass-Steagall or not regulating some derivatives was a wise policy choice. More to the point, I think a lot of people now will fault the Federal Reserve for keeping interest rates too low, which propelled the housing boom and led to certain excess. My question basically is, do you think that a regulator will ever be able to outwit or even understand the financial engineering departments of a bank so that they can question the bank's risk management department or the willingness of a bank to take on certain risk positions because banks will always have one major advantage over regulators, which is that they pay considerably more money than a regulator ever will, and they will be able to attract, I think, better talent in the long run. I think this goes back to, and I'll invite Steve to comment, because I think in a way some of the points he made about human nature really relate to this too. And he's done a lot of work on systemic risk regulation. You know, regulation uh, can't prevent uh, all bad things from happening. It's just not going to be the case. Uh, we have, you choose your analogy, we have a great highway system, but we still have accidents. Uh, and we have great roads, we have uh, uh, very diligent state patrolmen, and all kinds of ingredients to make it safe, but still unattractive things happen. Uh, 
Uh, um, I, I do believe, though, my, my supposition is that our regulate, regulatory system in general, as I said a little while ago, is outdated and has been built over time, brick on top of brick, and just really needs to be rethought. In some cases, it's more regulation and supervision. In other cases, it's less or different. Uh, so I don't think it's as simple, and I get frustrated when someone says it's more or less. I, I think they're kind of taking a complex problem and, and devaluing it by not really focusing on the differences. Uh, I believe that, the, and this is, I'm pretty invested in the proposal that we wrote a year ago in Treasury, and we called it an objective-based regulatory system. We had three objectives. We thought the system should be safe. We thought institutions should, should operate in a regime that they had the highest probability of being successful over a long time, and systemically important institutions shouldn't be able to arbitrage and find the lowest possible barrier. And, and investor protection and consumer protection were paramount. Those were the three objectives. And then once you say, if you agree, then you say, how can you best accomplish those? And that's really the idea of a market supervision regulator or, super, or, or systemic risk, very strong prudential regulation, and, and, and then a, a very high level of commitment to investor and consumer protection. And I don't think you're going to have someone uh, be able to uh, um, eliminate unattractive outcomes. I just don't think that's the case. But what you want to do is either make them so they're not as systemically damaging or once they occur, control the damage. Someone used this analogy yesterday at a conference where basically, number one, if your house is on fire, protect your house. Number two, make sure it doesn't spread to the next house. And number three, after you get the fire out, what can you do to make it safe again and so you don't have fires again? I think that's the way to think about it. Let me add, if I could, and I agree with everything you said, Bob. Um, one of the problems we have is that financial markets evolve so rapidly and often in such unexpected ways that any prescriptive regulation is cannot address all the potential failures. Of course, regulators are always going to be behind the curve in terms of innovation. Um, so one thing at least one could do is to try to look to other areas where you have, I guess, one could liken a financial market to a complex engineering uh, system where you have um, unintended consequences and nonlinearity. And uh, there are principles there that say that you're always going to have problems. There are always going to be fires, always going to be breakdowns. And what you want to do is to limit the consequences. And I think ultimately, whatever we come up with, our regulatory system needs to focus on limiting the consequences of collapses. Yeah, let me, let me add something to this. It, it, First of all, I think there are a number of parts of the regulatory system that, that, are, uh, that definitely need to be streamlined. One of the problems we've had is something called regulatory arbitrage. Uh, you have, uh, if, if you are a particular, if you're regulated by a particular regulator and they tell you to do something, you say, well, if you insist that I do this, I will just recharter myself somewhere else. Uh, you also have the, the, the equivalent of a regulatory arbitrage happening uh, across uh, centers between London and New York. I mean, this is one of the things where, where London and New York and other international centers try to uh, go to the, uh, the lowest common denominator rather than to the, the, the most pristine and uh, denominator of excellence. Um, the the uh, proper supervision uh, piece, I think, has always been a challenge. Uh, we've always had, I call it the horizon problem. It, you know, you always have a horizon. You know, back in the 1930s, your horizon was closer in. Today, the horizon's farther away. So you always have the issue of, of really trying to predict or understand what's over the horizon. And that is a difficulty. I think that the best way, though, that you deal with that is by separating out risk management. And, and, and let's, let's go back to what was happening in the, in the early, uh, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. When the commercial banks were, were uh, highly circumscribed, they were in corporate form and they were highly regulated. The investment banks were actually in, in partnership form, and it wasn't until 1970 that they petitioned the New York Stock Exchange to allow themselves to, uh, to raise external capital. Until that time, those, those investment banks, who weren't allowed to take the greatest amount of risk, they took the risk, but they were taking it with their own money. And, and that is one thing that I think we do need to re-examine is, is how, when we do have institutions that are going to be taking a lot of risk, we have to align the risk incentives with people's personal incentives. And that has to be put back. I think that genie has to be put back in the bottle. Okay. Um, I think we can probably take two questions at most next. You had next. And 
Yes, I wondered if any of y'all had any knowledge of or opinion about uh, a new movement for monetary and banking reform uh, whose two main ideas, or the first idea is that government could pretty much fund itself without borrowing and with limited taxation, and the second one was that a uh, nationally run banking system, um, separate from the non-banking system, could be run as a public service at very low interest cost and, uh, and for non-speculative purposes, which I think speculation is probably one of the things that's uh, most contributed to our problem. And uh, yes, that's it. <laughs> oh, and by the way, would like to know any more about this. I'm going to pass out these through the audience, if I may. And um, slightly more radical solution to the problem than that has been suggested here today. Thanks. I, I, I assume this is a sort of public utility version yeah, of, yeah. Ed? Yeah. That is on the table. I mean, in uh, some of the European reports that have come out and the Group 30 have basically said we need to restrict the types of activities that banks can do, proprietary trading, for example, some of the other activities, and the idea that they would become more like a public utility. There's no sense that they should be moved back into the public sector, but rather they should be run on the private sector on a much more restrained basis um, so that they'd be more safe and sound. Whether that will have some traction, that would mean in this country, in a sense going back to what was suggested, we'd have to reinstate class legal. Yeah. You know, we started this in the 30s, we got rid of it, and now we're going back to the 30s by analogy as to what happened. And the question is going to be whether we want to revisit some of the key political decisions we made back in the 30s. And that was that investment banking was too risky to commercial banking, which was more straightforward, more like utility. You took deposits, you loaned to people, to businesses, to people wanting mortgages. That got blended together. The question is going to be whether we undo it. And I think there's pretty strong support to restrict activities with respect to the large banks. It's reminiscent of the core bank yes, concept of 10 right, years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, one more question with the green sweater. Yeah. Yes, my, my question is, do you guys feel that speculation is inevitable? I mean, you know, 1890, speculation in railroads, you know, speculation led to the Depression in 1929, 30. I think this discussion is almost silly in a sense if we agree that speculation is inevitable, and if it isn't, how do we sort of prevent speculation, whether in the real economy or the financial um, markets at large? Before I pass it over, isn't the real problem the leverage of the speculation? That I, I personally think speculation is inevitable. We, we really Is it are. desirable? I mean, it's ultimately desirable as well. Uh, yeah, if it's... One person is taking a conservative position, the other counterparty is speculating. I mean, that's how markets operate. One person has a view and the other is prepared to bet against it. Um, so it's not so bad. I think it's the leverage that you said, and, and that's what really happened, is that the leverage went up to 35 to 40 to 1 because of internal risk modeling, and that is what I think has really gotten a lot of attention. Lost, yeah, that's where we lost a handle on it. Well, I would like to thank everybody, especially the panelists. But Bill, you wanted to add a... I just, I just wanted to uh, put in a plug for the Duke Project, if I may. Do you mind if I... Sure. Great. Um, the Duke Project is, has been something that we've been, that's been going on for the entire academic year. We do meet every Wednesday night. Uh, we have three sessions left. Next Wednesday night at 6 o'clock here, we are uh, focusing on, on banking regulation and the like. Uh, also international uh, impacts of, of, uh, of what's been going on in, in these markets. The following week, we, are, we have a, a, a star-studded panel from uh, uh, someone formerly of Moody's, a, a managing director of Moody's who is uh, testifying in front of Congress uh, on many occasions. And we have the, uh, uh, the head of, uh, of, uh, of uh, markets for, from the SEC. Um, here to talk about, uh, about uh, rating agencies and the problems of accounting. And then the week after that, we have the, um, the head of risk management from Goldman Sachs here. So we invite all of you to come for these next three weeks. We would love to have you. Thank you. Great, Bill. Thank you. Th <clears throat>Thank you to the panelists. Uh, you're all welcome to join us at a reception afterwards. The panelists will be there um, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So please 
uh, join us for a glass of wine. I hope your report continues to have traction.